you're going to. So it's Nehemiah chapter 1. These are the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and in shame. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants. Confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen, to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name, and give success to your servant today, and grant him mercy in the sight of the man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. It would be helpful if you have a Bible. It's, uh, if you have a Bible with you, please do open it at Nehemiah if you haven't already, or you may want to look at the text on the phone. And um, we are looking at uh, this chapter one of Nehemiah this morning. Um, Nehemiah, who was he? He was a man who lived in Susa, the capital of Persia. Um, Nehemiah had um, served the king there, um, and he, actually that king, Artaxerxes, isn't ma mentioned by name in this chapter, but he is in the next. Nehemiah um, was, had never seen Jerusalem. He'd never been there. But as we will see, his heart was with God's people, his people over there in Jerusalem. Nehemiah's job was um, very important. He had a, a superb role, um, prestigious role. Um, he's a man with status because he serves the king of Persia. And his, uh, right at the end there, you saw the word cupbearer. Um, it sounds like a kind of waiter. Actually, he was perhaps more than a waiter, he was, uh, in a way, a bodyguard because he would have been responsible for what the king was going to drink and perhaps eat as well. He had a huge responsibility. Can you imagine? He is serving the king of that empire. Uh, he's a servant of a pagan king, and he's always got to be faithful if there's any illness on part of the king, he'll probably get the blame. Uh, and if anybody's going to try and poison the king, Nehemiah will be the first to get it. So he will be testing everything. So his life uh, is of high status, as I said, but perhaps carries a risk as well. The other thing we see about Nehemiah is that he's a servant of the Lord. 
And uh, this comes out clearly in the text. He's not just a servant of this pagan king. He's a servant of the Lord, the God of heaven. And uh, we will see that this takes priority over everything. This is the number one thing in his life. He may be a servant to the king, but above all, he's a servant to the Lord. His allegiance to the Lord is higher than any other person or thing. Eight times in this passage you see him using the word servant, and always as servant of the Lord, whether it's him or God's people, servants of the Lord. He um, lived in a heathen culture, and he saw himself as a servant of the Lord. So how you see yourself is of great significance, isn't it? Um, how you see yourself will direct your life and actions. Um, and seeing himself as a servant of the God of heaven, um, that meant his life was geared that way, whatever his job may have been in that culture. His heart was for God's name, God's kingdom, God's reputation, and God's praise. And uh, the message this morning is under the title of Prayer That God Hears. What is the kind of prayer that God hears? And we'll be looking at this chapter, and I'm going to read bits of it, and if you're able to follow it with me, that will be helpful. Let's start off with the first four verses. Let's hear them again. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. These people who come from Jerusalem and Nehemiah wants to know the news and he actually asks them, he inquires how things are going there and the report that was given devastated him. We can see that it hit him emotionally, physically, spiritually and what we, what we see was a tremendous response here. He said, I sat down and wept, mourned for days I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And we see later on that day and night, the news had that effect. I wonder what, what effect does the news have on you? Sometimes, um, what is your response to devastating news? Um, and I wonder what news could be brought to you that would be devastating? What sort of thing would hit you like this? Would it be your house has burnt down? Would it be you've lost your job? Would it be you're financially ruined? But for Nehemiah, there was something even greater than that, which so devastated him that we can see the response. It moved him to earnest prayer. Uh, and earnest prayer, what you pray for earnestly is an indicator of your heart, isn't it? Um, it shows what is of high value, uh, what is dear, really dear to us, is revealed in the way we respond to situations and news we hear, the way we respond to people in trouble. So we need to understand the heart of Nehemiah, which comes out here. Let's go on. I'm reading again verse 4 and a couple more verses. As soon as I heard these words... I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive 
and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. Nehemiah has a sincere love for the Lord and for his people. A love and a devotion that moves him to extraordinary prayer. Way different to kind of comfortable and convenient prayer, prayer that is much easier but far more intense. What is prayer that the Lord hears? Prayer that God hears. Is it not prayer for God's heart, God's kingdom? Broken-hearted repentance we see here in Nehemiah. An appeal to God's promises too. And an utter dependence upon his grace and mercy. As we read on, i just read 6 and 7 again for you. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you and day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. Note that he's praying to the Lord God of heaven. He's very clear who he prays to. The I am, the Lord. Lord, L-O-R-D in capitals, indicates the I am who revealed himself many, many years ago, said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is the God who Nehemiah is praying to, the God who's revealed himself. Notice he's not just praying into the air or just praying to some God. There are peoples in the world who pray earnestly, but they don't know who they're praying to. Did you know that? There are some who pray and uh, they just hope their prayer is heard somehow, but they don't actually have any idea of who they're praying to. Nehemiah knows very well who he's praying to, and he makes it clear and states it. O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him, and keep his commandments. This Lord had called these people to be his servants, his people, and so he's praying for them. We must be clear to whom we pray. We must be very clear who it is who has spoken, and we're not praying to a God of our imagination. We're not making the Lord uh, into what we would like him to be, inventing what we think of as God. Um, this is the character of God that Nehemiah is um, revealing in his prayer. You can see how he knows what God's commands are, who God is, and the promises that God has given. And so he makes an appeal um, on behalf of God's people. And he says, verse 7, he says, we have acted very corruptly against you. Notice the we includes himself. He's very personal here. He says, even I and my father's house have sinned. It's not just they've sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me, and if you keep my commandments and do them, even though your dispersed are under the farthest skies, I will gather them from there, and I will bring them to the place I have chosen to make my name dwell there. See, he's referring to God's promises, what God had said. He's acknowledging that the warning that God had given has been fulfilled. 
And a terrible thing has happened to God's people. Yes, they've been taken out of Jerusalem, so many of them dispersed. That was the exile. And some are now coming back. He's remembering God's promise, God's promises. Sometimes we call this pleading the promises of God, so that when we pray, we remind God of his promises. Does he need reminding? No, he doesn't. But we do, and when we pray, we are guided in what to pray by those promises. Be sure God hears such prayer, such earnest, serious, repentant prayer. And did you notice this, uh, my name, at the end of verse 9? I have chosen to make my name dwell there. And that word, that expression comes up again a little later. Central to Nehemiah's heart and to his prayer is the name of the Lord, that the name of the Lord would be honored, that the name of the Lord would be revealed, revered, and loved, and the Lord would be extolled, lifted up. And that's a prayer that God hears. You think of the Lord's Prayer, which has become more meaningful even to me as I've read this. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what Nehemiah really is beginning to pray for the glory of the name of the Lord. Jesus gave us that pattern for prayer and I can see more and more why this is the kind of prayer God hears. There's a song that I love very much called um, Jesus, Lover of My Soul, but it's not the older one, I think it's a new one, I think by Paul Oakley, and some lines in it are so helpful. Um, the song lines go, it's all about you, Jesus, for your glory and your fame. It's not about me, as if you should do things my way. It's all about you. That's what glorifies the Lord. That is prayer that the Lord hears. You, you Lord, and your are mentioned in this chapter ten times at least, I see. Um, I'll just read verse ten. As an example, they, God's people, are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. It's God who's been at work. These are God's people. He cares about them. And so Nehemiah has them also on his heart. Verse 11. Let me read that. It's the last verse. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. <clears throat> this man is the king. And finally, the king is mentioned as king right at the end of this chapter, as is also Nehemiah's role. The focus is on the Lord. But why is he asking for mercy in the sight of this man, this king? Because of the background. This king is the one who signed an edict that the building, the rebuilding of Jerusalem would not happen. In fact, there were those who had started to rebuild. There was the temple that was down, the walls, the gates, and they had started. And enemies, Jerusalem was surrounded by enemies. I should have explained that with the walls down and the gates burned, Jerusalem was utterly defenseless. They were exposed. They were vulnerable and surrounded by enemies who were delighted to see Jerusalem destroyed, delighted to see that work of God put down. They were there. And they, were, they had access to Jerusalem because the walls were down. 
because the gates were destroyed, burned by fire. Jerusalem was in a terrible state, so no wonder the people who brought the, the, uh, the news said they are in great trouble and shame because the walls of Jerusalem broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Prayer that God hears. Prayer that the Lord's work will be revived. The people of God will be revived. Grant your servant mercy in the sight of this man. And Nehemiah mentions that he is the servant of the Lord many times. That word servant you'll see is repeated, I think it's about eight times in the chapter. He sees himself as the servant of the Lord and he sees the people of God as servants of the Lord. He doesn't mention um, servant, that word, to the king. He's mentioning, he's talking of servant to the Lord. Our God hears such prayer and if Nehemiah didn't believe this, how could he be praying like this? And how do we know that Nehemiah heard, believed, I should say, that God hears? We know that because Nehemiah is moving towards doing something about it. He's moving towards action. You get this clue here in the last verse. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. So this man, the king, who gave this edict that Jerusalem should not be built, we now need to see him reversing that order. And Nehemiah, who has access to the king through his job, is seeing the possibility of speaking to the king. He's praying for mercy that the king will change his mind. The king of the empire. Maybe he knows the verse of scripture that says the king's heart is a stream in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. I think that's Proverbs chapter 13, if you want to look it up. So there's the history of this situation, and there's the huge ask, isn't it? In fact, you look at it, it's probably an impossible situation for God's people, for Nehemiah. But you saw the video earlier, did you not? Hudson Taylor. He knew of the masses of Chinese people who had never heard of Jesus and were not going to hear of Jesus while the missionaries stayed on the outskirts of China, near the ports. That was the area where they were. Maybe that was the safer area. Maybe that means they could get away quickly by boat. No one was going into the interior. And Hudson Taylor's heart was gripped by this massive need of people to hear the gospel. You know, the Lord cares about people, doesn't he? People. And this was laid on um, Hudson Taylor's heart. This was like an impossible goal. Um, they had not heard of the grace of Jesus Christ. They had not heard of the call to repentance. They had not heard of the salvation through faith in Christ of the cross and the risen Lord. And his heart, Hudson Taylor's heart, was burdened for God's gift of help for this task, this great task. And as you heard, he came to a conviction that he needed to step forward in action towards this need. And similarly, Nehemiah is heading in that direction through his prayer. And you heard that Hudson Taylor immediately set about recruiting 24 people back in London, I think from London, Two for each of the 11 provinces had not any witness up to then. And you heard, of course, that that was followed up by many more. We'll come back to that in a minute, perhaps. But I, as I read this passage of Nehemiah and could see that he was a man of faith as he asked the prayers, I was reminded of what Jesus said to his followers um, and I'm going to read a little bit for you 
from Mark chapter 11, verse 22. And uh, here's what Jesus says. Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Mountain. I used to think, why, uh, what's the point of moving a mountain? <laughs> it doesn't seem a very sensible thing to pray for. But now I see with situations like Hudson Taylor uh, and Nehemiah, what they were looking at was a mountain to be moved. A mountain, it fits perfectly, doesn't it? And I'm sure Jesus was thinking of a situation like that. A mountain that is an obstacle to the work of God, to the saving of souls. And here he is giving this promise. I say to you, and he's saying, you pray in faith. Going on to verse 24. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. And that's what Nehemiah was seeking to do, wasn't he? And the Lord honors a prayer of faith like that. Not just faith in your own thoughts, but faith in Christ, faith in God's promises, faith in the knowledge of what God wants to do in Jesus' name. Jesus gave us the promise. We ask the Father anything in his name, he will do it. And this was for the name of the Lord and for his people. He's seeking the honor of God. In the Old Testament we read in Samuel, the Lord says, those who honor me, I will honor. If your heart is to honor the Lord and see his name honored, that's the kind of prayer that God hears. At this point, with uh, Mark 11 in front of me, we have to say that there are some things which we could call prayer blockers, uh, obstacles that can hinder your prayers, our prayers, can actually prevent a prayer being answered. And here it is, going on in what Jesus said about praying in faith. He said, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Now, why does he say that there after teaching about prayer in faith and answering? Because if you are harboring unforgiveness or a grudge against somebody, your faith to believe is hindered. Your prayer is blocked. This is what Jesus is saying. An unforgiving attitude towards others is totally contradictory to a faith in Jesus Christ because he's forgiven us he's saved us and so how can we not forgive somebody else Jesus several times talks about this in the New Testament and I wonder do you struggle here at this point if you do there's something you need to deal with today because it's a blight on your relationship with God another thing that comes to mind here is that, and perhaps it's linked, but if, you're, if we are hiding sin in our heart, then we cannot say really that we are repentant people. I just uh, always remember this verse at the end of Psalm 66, and I'll just read it to you. <clears throat> the psalmist is saying, I cried to him with my mouth, high praise was on my tongue, but if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, that's sin, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. What does he mean? He means if I hide sin in my heart, I'm not willing to bring it out before God. I am not willing to confess it. I certainly am not wanting other people to know. No one knows of this, only the Lord. Don't allow this evil to camp to stay in your house one or your heart one day more or one hour more if i had cherished 
precious to me. Iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. That's another prayer blocker, isn't it? And, and finally, James, uh, he points out another one in his uh, letter, chapter 4, I think it is. He talks about asking amiss or asking wrongly or for wrong things. And he says, um, you, don't, you ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. In other words, you are number one rather than what God wants. Um, so let's be praying above all for that which exalts the Lord and is according to his will. I was reading that promise this morning as it just happened in 1 John chapter 5. He said, this is the confidence that we have in him, in Jesus, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that we, he hears us, we know that we have obtained the requests made of him. Isn't that beautiful? I'm going to read again that verse 11. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name, there it is, your name, and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Notice the fellowship of prayer here. It's not just the prayer of your servant, it's the prayer of your servants, plural. That's a beautiful thing. They were together in prayer. Perhaps he met with some of these brethren who had come from Jerusalem and they prayed together. And there have been others there. And I wonder, how about us? How about you? Are you ready to join others in prayer seeking God's kingdom? to come on earth as it is in heaven. Are you ready to step forward um, in service for the Lord, as a servant of the Lord? You know, today, here, we face a huge gospel need in our society. We could talk about the needs across the world, and there are millions who have not yet heard the name of Jesus. And I believe it's more than a billion. There are such numbers of people that don't even have the scriptures in their own language. But there are those who don't even know Jesus' name. That's a huge need. But there is a need in our country too now, isn't there? There are people being brought up in homes where Jesus is never mentioned. Uh, and there is no knowledge of Jesus and what he has done for us. Uh, and who he is, is not known. There is a great need. So this passage in Nehemiah is relevant for us today as well, as it was in Hudson Taylor's day. And in our society today, evil has been released. Surely you would know that from observing what's going on, observing the news in our culture, destroying the protective walls, bringing down the gates, shifting the boundaries, vital safeguards that were put there to protect, to safeguard the lives of people. And these are being brought down, affecting from the youngest, even the unborn, right the way through to the elderly, to the great harm of people, to, which will bring great trouble and great shame, just as is mentioned here. It will devastate our land, and it will attack the church of Jesus Christ. And already we're beginning to see that. Do you see it? Are you listening to the news as Jer um, Nehemiah was? And what I'm referring to is not COVID-19. That is small compared to what we're referring to here, which is a spiritual matter far more harmful than the pandemic. So who will pray? Who will pray the prayer that honors God, seeks his kingdom, prayer that God hears? And I believe this is a time for us to stand in prayer together to the God of heaven in the name of Jesus. This is such a time for urgent prayer right here in our culture. Will we care?
where we care for people. It is said that the first, um, and we can see it here, the first concern for Nehemiah was for the people of God. Um, that was what it was all about. God's work, God's kingdom, the people. I'm thinking of South Hanwell Baptist Church. I, I believe it's, it should be of concern to us that we don't actually gather for prayer. Um, there's very little of that. And even these days, it's easy to do so on Zoom. And I think in the period of some 50 years that Rosamond and I have been here, I don't think I've seen a time when it looks as we are as weak as we are when it comes to gathering together for prayer. And that is of great concern. But we are grateful for those who do. I would not want to uh, fail to say that. But I do think we've drifted and we need to watch it because great, um, it has a great importance for the kingdom of God. So where are those who will pray together? We want to do that. Do we not? God hears such prayer. Let me just um, give a summary of some of the points. Prayer that God hears. Prayer that God hears is prayer from a God-honoring heart. Loves the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul. Not self first. Um, his name. Concern for his name, his honor, his kingdom. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer that God hears. Prayer that God hears is prayer from a repentant heart and a forgiving heart. No secret sin being held on to. No unforgiveness towards other people. Go back to the Lord's prayer. Forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Built into that prayer, Jesus made that point very clear. Prayer that God hears. A heart that has faith based on God's character, God's promises, God's word. Not a faith based on our invention or imagination of God. And that kind of faith can be expressed with no doubting, as James says. Let him pray in faith with no doubting. That person, he says, will not receive anything from the Lord. The prayer of faith in the Lord Jesus' name. And finally, God hears prayer from a heart that's committed to God's purposes such that we are ready to step forward in service. I was reflecting on the bit about Hudson Taylor and the um, watchword for the, church, the China Inland Mission, which was faith, prayer, and sacrifice. And we know that many who went were taking a step of sacrifice, and many who went did not live very long and lost family members. That was a huge step, but it came as a result of hearing God's call, and they were a mission that moved forward in prayer. And so was Nehemiah doing. And uh, really, we're gonna hear a bit more about him over the subsequent weeks. We just have to stop, uh, I think, today at the end of chapter one. Prayer that God hears, a heart committed, ready to serve, a heart that says, I am your servant, Lord, above all else. Servant to the Lord. Impossible situations. <laughs> Nehemiah seemed impossible. The one about China seems impossible. Today's situation seems impossible too. And yes, outside of Jesus Christ, it's true, it's true, impossible. But in Christ, possible. Because he is the Lord, the Lord of heaven and earth, the King. Do you know him? Do you know that you are in Christ and can join with this kind of prayer that God hears? Does he have your heart? Does he have the aims of your heart? Do you love him with all your heart or want to 
Have you truly repented of your sins? Have you received his grace? This is important, isn't it? And maybe you feel you want to talk. Um, do you see yourself as a servant, a servant of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ? That's what he calls us to be, isn't it? So that his work is done. And if you would like to respond to the message any particular way, feel free uh, to linger for a little while and I will be around. But maybe you will want to talk to others or you might want to um, send an email um, to the church, send a message. Let's pray briefly together, shall we? Father God, we thank you for your word which always penetrates our hearts and challenges us but encourages us too. We thank you for people like Nehemiah who was ready to serve you though he didn't know what it was going to cost him. It might even cost his life in the presence of the king or further afield. Lord, we thank you for the encouragement. We thank you for the inspiration from your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who applies your word to our hearts. Give us open ears, open hearts, this morning and in these days to walk with you for the glory of your name, for the building of your kingdom, for doing your will and your pleasure. And we praise you for all that you are able to do far more than all we ask or think. We ask your blessing on each person here and online for this in Jesus' name. Amen.